Our text for this morning is Galatians chapter 5, verses 6 to 12. Hear the word of the true and living God. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything, but only faith working through love. You were running well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion is not from him who calls you. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. I have confidence in the Lord that you will take no other view, and the one who is troubling you will bear the penalty, whoever he is. But if I, brothers, still preach circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? In that case, the offense of the cross has been removed. I wish those who unsettle you would emasculate themselves. The word of the Lord. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the great blessing of drawing us together as your people. We thank you for the blessing of being able to gather in your name. Lord, we pray now that you would send your spirit to open up ears, eyes, hearts, and minds. Lord, do it only you can in causing these truths to be received. Lord, we pray that it would be only your truth spoken and nothing but your truth. Lord, I pray that you would get me out of the way. Uh, and Lord, may you cause your word to come alive in the hearts of your people. Lord, may you be glorified now. May your people be edified and may sinners be converted as your gospel is preached. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we pick up again with our series in Galatians. And once again, to recap, uh, Galatians is a letter written by the Apostle Paul to the churches in the region of Galatia. Paul is addressing the false teaching that had begun to work its way into the churches in the area, specifically men that had been teaching that circumcision and certain other elements of Jewish law uh, were necessary for salvation. Now Paul has identified this as a false teaching. In chapter 1 he called it a false gospel, a different gospel that is really no gospel at all. And through Galatians, Paul has been building a devastating case against these false teachers by demonstrating that salvation has always been by grace through faith. Works of the law have never been able to save any sinner uh, because the law requires perfection and no sinner is able to perfectly keep God's law. And so we pick up again in chapter 5 as Paul continues his argument. Let us read together Galatians 5 verse 6. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything, only faith working through love. So first things first. Christianity is all about being in Christ Jesus. You know, Galatians has been dealing with the question of justification. That is a great term, talking about the question of how can a sinner be made right with God? Right? How can we who have sinned against God uh, attain a right standing before him? You know, what is the path? How can we be justified? How can we be declared righteous by God? And according to Paul, the answer that his opponents give to this question is works of the law. Paul has characterized their teaching as being a reliance upon works of the law, looking to the law as your path of justification. And Paul's answer in contrast is that justification comes through faith alone. A sinner cannot work to earn salvation, but Jesus Christ has done for us what we could not do for ourselves. Justification then comes through faith. For it is through faith that we are joined to Christ, united to Christ. For all those who are united to Christ in this way, his death for sin is counted as their death for sin. His life of obedience to God's law is counted as their life of obedience to God's law. Everything that Christ accomplished is credited to those who have faith in him. 
And so we see the whole of salvation is in our union with Christ. John Murray writes, Union with Christ is really the central truth of the whole doctrine of salvation, not only in its application, but also in its once-for-all accomplishment in the finished work of Christ. And so again and again in the New Testament, you will see this language, in Him, in Christ, in the Lord. As one of the Reformers put it, as long as Christ remains outside of us and we are separated from Him, all that he has suffered and done for the salvation of the human race remains useless and of no value to us. So we see as long as we stand apart from Christ, nothing he did as mediator can be of any use to us. So we see this doctrine and it's referenced here in this text. Salvation is being in Christ. Uh, we must be united to him. And the way in which we are united to Christ is by faith alone. And so he, notice Paul's first point here where he says, In Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything but only faith working through love. So catch this. Circumcision has no bearing upon our union with Christ. Right, that's what he's saying here to the Galatians. They are joined to Christ and thereby justified by faith alone. Circumcision plays no part in this. And so Paul has said, whether you are a Jew or a Gentile, male or female, slave or free, you will all be justified in the exact same way. And that is faith alone. Now, one of Paul's arguments against circumcision has been uh, in Romans chapter 4 that Abraham himself, right? You remember Abraham, the one who first received the sign of circumcision, he was declared righteous on the basis of faith, right? Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. So he was justified by faith before he received the sign of circumcision. And so Paul says in Romans 4 verse 11, the, the purpose was to make him the father of all who believe without being circumcised so that righteousness would be counted to them as well. We are united to Christ by faith. We are therefore justified by faith. And whether or not you're circumcised makes no difference. It has no bearing upon your union with Christ. For in Christ Jesus, again, union with Christ language, in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything. So Paul says, you have no grounds for boasting either way. Either the Judaizers and, and the circumcised uh, Jewish Christians in Galatia, nor the uncircumcised Gentiles. Neither of those accounts for anything. Circumcised, uncircumcised, you are joined to Christ in the same way. And the same is true for us. And so one of the major implications, if we will understand the gospel rightly, if we will understand this doctrine of justification by faith alone, is that it will dramatically impact how we view and interact with one another. For consider this. In Christ, all of the barriers which would normally bring divisions between people are irrelevant. Neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything in Christ. And so then, neither does age, neither does skin color, neither does nationality, wealth, class, marital status, language, but anyone who turns to Christ in faith will be joined to him in exactly the same way that you were. Galatians 3.28, there, no, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is no male and female, for you are all 
one in Christ Jesus. So how can I look down on anyone when I realize that God will accept them in the exact same way that he accepted me? All people are made in the image of God and will be accepted by God, by grace through faith, if they will repent and believe. And so we are made one in Christ Jesus, and we see that which binds us together is far deeper and more significant than anything that would drive us apart. In Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything, but only faith working through love. Neither circumcision nor uncircumcision will commend us to God. Neither of these will have any bearing on our standing before God. What does count, what will avail to our acceptance with God, as Matthew Henry puts it, is faith. Faith working through love. And here we have an important point. We can ask it as a question. What kind of faith is saving faith? Is it a living faith or a dead faith? Living. This is the question addressed in James chapter 2. Now a lot of people would think or argue that James and Paul are actually contradicting one another, uh, but I believe they are in complete agreement. So remember that Paul has been addressing people in Galatians who would be looking to their law-keeping, looking to their works as a means of justification. And James is dealing with an entirely different question. James is addressing people who would use justification by faith in order to excuse their fruitless life. And so far from being in contradiction to one another, These are two sides of the same coin. And I'm very glad that God has seen fit to give us both perspectives. So James says, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. And so we see then true faith is not a dead faith, but a living faith. It is a faith that produces something in people. And so we see one of the dangers that the apostles are keen to avoid is somebody misusing the glorious doctrine of justification by faith in order to excuse a sinful lifestyle. Now, what do I mean? Well, someone might say, well, if justification is by faith alone, and you're saying that my works do not contribute to the ground of my salvation then I can live however I want, and it doesn't matter. Faith alone, right? Well, the apostles answer this by demonstrating the nature of true saving faith. James 2, verse 14. What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith, but does not have works? Someone says he has faith. If you'd ask him, he'd say, oh yes, I am a Christian. I have faith in God. I believe in Christ. But there is then nothing in his life that would back up his claim. There are no works. There is no fruit. There's no demonstration. uh, There's nothing in his life that would indicate to you that he actually means what he says. So what good is it, my brothers, if someone says... He has faith, but does not have works. Can that faith save him? A dead faith. And so we see that James is framing his discussion here uh, by looking at the nature of saving faith. Verse 17, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. So we see true saving faith produces something in people. Faith by itself, faith that doesn't produce anything, James says, is dead. 
Living faith, saving faith, produces something. It yields fruit, good works. So the person then who says they have faith but has no work is making a hollow profession. James says their faith is a dead faith. And a dead faith is not a saving faith. So here we have another solemn warning passage. This is the kind of warning that will shake true believers out of apathy. If you claim to be a Christian, but you display no love for God through your life, do you think that such a faith can save you? The old question goes, if you were arrested for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? So friends, examine yourselves. Feel the weight of these warnings. For as James says, dead faith is not saving faith. You say you believe in God? Good, James says. So do the demons. And they tremble. James 2.19 True conversion involves a heart change. A Christian is a disciple. We are followers. And so you cannot claim the name of Christ and ignore his word. As Jesus says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I tell you? Now, one of the saddest realities that we see in the scriptures is the fact that there will be people who come to Christ on Judgment Day believing that they are Christians who will then be turned away and thrown into outer darkness. Matthew 7, verse 21, Jesus says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Do you see what Jesus is saying here? Even some people who appeared outwardly very religious, people claiming the name of Christ, coming and calling upon him, Lord, Lord, who perhaps even did mission work in the name of Christ, many mighty works. These people come to him expecting entrance into his kingdom, and Jesus says, depart from me, I never knew you, you workers of lawlessness. Depart from me, you sinners, you lawless ones, you people who refuse to do the will of my Father who is in heaven. There are people and will be people who think that they're saved, but who are still living life on their own terms. To make matters worse, they've maybe even heard it all their lives that because they have prayed a prayer, because they've signed their name on a card and asked Jesus into their hearts, this means they're now good to go. They got their ticket to heaven punched. They can now live however they want and still be saved. Now that is a lie, and it is a lie from the pit of hell. It is a lie that makes a mockery of the grace of God and a lie that gives false assurance to people who are on the road to hell. Heed the warnings. Hear the words of the Savior. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. True faith is living faith. It is a faith that produces something in people. Neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything. 
These external things do not save you. Why? Because it is only through true saving faith that we are united to Christ. Now, getting circumcised in the flesh does not require saving faith. And this may be a tough pill to swallow, but saying a sinner's prayer also does not save you. Now, you can get people to say a prayer and to fill out a card who still have no clue what the gospel is. I've seen it. People hear a quick little pitch about how great heaven is, and then they are told that if they pray this little prayer and ask Jesus into their heart, they will get to go to heaven. Well, that sounds like a great deal. (laughs) Sign me up. But notice that to repeat some words after an evangelist doesn't require true faith any more than circumcision does. And so none of these external things unite us to Christ. Only faith working through love. True faith is a living faith, not a dead faith. And so we see that those with true living faith will give evidence that their hearts have been made new through the fruit that follows. The faith will work itself out in love. And we'll come back to this later. Let's continue on. You were running well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion is not from him who calls you. So the Galatian churches, they they were doing well. They were running a good race. When Paul last saw them, they were all on the right track. He asks, now who hindered you from obeying the truth? Paul answers his own question saying, this persuasion is not from him who calls you. Now God is the one who called them. And Paul says, this teaching, this persuasion is not from God. It is not from him who calls you. Whoever it is that you're listening to, it's not God. Paul leaves it to them to then figure out where this teaching is coming from. The implication being that if it's not from God, then it is from the enemy. I think there's a wake-up call for us. Very important reminder. We are in a battle. Now, Satan is a defeated foe, but until Christ returns, he will still be making war on the church. Paul calls on Christians to put on the full armor of God. It's a metaphor that he employs to call them to be ready, to be on their guard. Now, if you forget that you're in a battle, you will inevitably drop your guard. You get lazy in your spiritual disciplines. We leave our armor and weapons at home. Now, what happens to a soldier who leaves their armor and weapon at home and then saunters into battle in their PJs <laughs> will be completely unequipped and unprepared. And so we need the regular reminder we are in a war. We have an enemy who desires to see us destroyed, and so we must always be diligent. Right? Do not be ignorant of the devil's schemes, Scripture says. We must be diligent, diligent to put sin to death, to make war on sin, to be aware of the devil's schemes, and to be diligent then in prayer, in reading the word, and in all of the spiritual disciplines. This persuasion is not from him who calls you. The second implication we see here is how scripture views false teaching. Remember that the message of the Judaizers was a false gospel, one that was no gospel at all. Paul has pronounced curses, anathemas, against those who would preach a false gospel. And here, the implication is, this false teaching is from the evil one. We, as the church, must therefore guard true doctrine. And to do this effectively, we need to know our Bibles. 
You know, the better we know the truth, the harder it will be for the enemy to deceive us. Verse 9. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. Paul is warning here about the influence of this false teaching, saying that just as a small amount of leaven can work its way through an entire batch of dough, so also false teaching, if not properly dealt with, can spread through an entire congregation. This is part of why church discipline is so important. If the church doesn't properly deal with sin or false teaching in its ranks, those things will spread. Paul makes that point clear in 1 Corinthians. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, a man was living in sexual sin, and the church in Corinth was actually congratulating itself for how tolerant they were. Paul instructs them, 1 Corinthians 5 verse 6, Your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Now, we've talked previously about how church discipline is a form of grace to the sinner in that it shows them the seriousness of their sin as a means, something God uses to draw them to repentance. And we see here another element to church discipline. Church discipline protects the entire church. Ecclesiastes 8 verse 11 says, Because the sentence against an evil deed is not executed speedily, the heart of the children of man is fully set to do evil. So what happens in the church when sin is not dealt with properly, when sin is tolerated? Well, it communicates to everyone. You know, maybe this isn't actually such a big deal after all. You know, maybe the church doesn't really believe what they've been preaching about the severity and danger of sin. So then sin spreads like leaven through a lump of dough. And so not only must we be willing to discipline for the sake of the sinner, we must be willing to discipline for the sake of the entire church. Verse 10. I have confidence in the Lord that you will take no other view And the one who is troubling you will bear the penalty, whoever he is. So Paul here expresses his hopeful confidence that the churches will side with him on these issues. The one troubling you will bear the penalty, whoever he is. Uh, It's a saying either that the false teachers will bear judgment from God, or perhaps that they will bear the judgment of church discipline. That is, the church, after taking the correct view, uh, will then take the necessary steps to remove those false teachers. Let them bear the penalty of church discipline. But if I, brothers, still preach circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? In that case, the offense of the cross has been removed. Now, Paul is likely responding to one of the charges from his critics. It sounds as if somebody was saying that Paul himself was actually still preaching a message of circumcision. And so he picks up this idea and then asks rhetorically, if I was still preaching circumcision, why are the Jews still persecuting me? Albert Barnes writes, circumcision is the special badge of the Jewish religion and it implies all the rest. Galatians 5.2. And Paul says, if I preach the necessity of circumcision, it would satisfy the Jews and save me from persecution. And so the very fact that he is still being persecuted, uh, he, he points out, if I were still preaching circumcision, this wouldn't be happening to me. The fact of his persecution at the hands of the Jews proves that he is not, in fact, preaching a message of circumcision, regardless of what his opponents may say. He says, in that case, if I were preaching circumcision, the offense of the cross has been removed. The JFB commentary says, it is just because I preach Christ crucified and not the Mosaic law as the sole ground of justification that they persecute me. 
Paul says, no, the offense of the cross has not been removed. I am not preaching circumcision, and so the Jews are continuing to persecute me. A crucified Messiah, Paul says in another place, is a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. The fact is, the message of the cross continues to be offensive. And this leads to the perennial temptation to sand off the rough edges, to water it down, or to change something about it. Right? We just need to make it a little more palatable, a little easier to swallow. And so we see many variations where the gospel gets watered down, dressed up, packaged in glitz and glam, or resold as a self-help message. But I hope if we have seen anything in our study of Galatians, it is the importance of not messing with the gospel. If you add to it or subtract from it, you get a different gospel, one that is no gospel at all. And so let us not ever apologize for the message. Let us never water it down or try to smooth out the rough parts. For in the wisdom and power of God, this is the only message of salvation. We preach Christ and Christ crucified. Our perfect Messiah, the Anointed One, sent by God to live a perfect life, die a brutal death on a bloody cross to pay the penalty for sin. We preach this message unfiltered and unvarnished, trusting that the Spirit of God will cause the Word of God to come alive in the hearts of the people of God. God knows what He's doing. And He doesn't need our help to make the message more palatable. In fact, as we've seen through Galatians, it is our solemn duty that we not alter the message in any way, but proclaim it just as he delivered it to us. Hear Paul's attitude toward those who would pervert the true gospel. I wish those who unsettle you would emasculate themselves. You know, I wish those troublemakers, these false teachers, would go the whole way. Right? Don't stop with the tip. <laughs> Cut the whole thing off. Right? Make themselves eunuchs. And there may be a bit of a play of words, a play on words here as well. The idea being, uh, just as uh, the foreskin gets cut off and thrown away in circumcision. Uh, Paul saying, may they be cut off and thrown away. JFB commentary puts it, you know, even as they desire your foreskin to be cut off and cast away by circumcision, so would that they even were cut off from your communion, being worthless as a castaway foreskin, close quote. And so if you find the language of scripture shocking or appalling, channel that shock and indignation toward the false teaching. Right? Ask the question, what is it that causes Paul to use this kind of language? And we've seen the zeal and indignation that Paul feels against false teaching in Galatians 1.8. He said there, if even we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. Let him be anathema. Quite literally, this is saying, let him be damned. May God damn those false teachers. Brothers and sisters, friends, visitors, guests, see how serious this is. The gospel is at stake Right? These were teachers, preachers, claiming to be representing Christ, claiming in a very real sense to be speaking on God's behalf, uh, teaching his word, claiming to communicate his will to his people, who were then preaching a different gospel. 
One that was no gospel at all. It was not the true gospel and therefore it could not save. Those who followed the message would therefore be damned. They would be led to hell by these false teachers. See what is on the line. See the importance of getting the gospel right. These are eternal matters. These are questions that have eternal consequences. You will spend eternity somewhere. So there's truly nothing more important than knowing that you have peace with God. You will stand before your creator one day and you will have to give an account to him of your life. And the scripture testifies to you that you are a sinner. By nature and by choice, we are all lawbreakers. You know, we've, we've seen this morning that there will be people who believed they were saved, who will be turned away from the presence of the Lord on Judgment Day. People who cry out, Lord, Lord, to whom he will respond, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. Have you been believing a false gospel? Have you been deceived into thinking that you could live life on your own terms and because of a prayer you said once, you were good to go? Or perhaps you've never come to Christ at all, but have always thought yourself to be a good person, good enough on your own merits. Well, let me remind you again of the scriptures. Galatians 3 verse 10, all who rely on works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. You know, Romans 3, none is righteous, no, not one. We all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And so if you are looking to your own works, your own good deeds, thinking you are good enough to earn justification, Scripture says you will be cursed by God. Why? Because God's standard is perfection, and none of us are perfect. What we need is a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Galatians 3.13 Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse us. He died in our place, taking the curse due to our sin upon himself. He rose from the dead, defeating the power of death and guaranteeing eternal life to all who come to him in faith and repentance. There is no other means of being made right with God. You know, if there were some other way, You know, if you could work to earn your own salvation, then Jesus Christ died for nothing. And God the Son did not send his Son, pardon me, God the Son did not die on the cross to simply be another option on the table. So I invite you, repent. Come to Christ in sincerity. Throw yourself upon the mercy of God and you will find a perfect Savior. It is by faith that we are joined to Christ. It is by faith that we receive the benefits of what he has done. And we must understand that there is a difference, a life and death difference, between true saving faith and simply making an empty profession of faith. The empty profession is dead faith. You know, a person who claims to be a Christian but whose life does not show it. And the Bible describes conversion to Christ as something involving a heart change. 2 Corinthians 5.17 If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone. Behold, the new has come. John 3, verse 3, Jesus says to Nicodemus, Truly, truly, I say to you, 
unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. The Christian is one who has been born again. We are new creatures in Christ. The old has passed away. Ezekiel 36, our hearts of stone have been removed and have been replaced with new hearts, hearts that work. And so what we need to understand is what Scripture teaches about conversion. There will be a change of life in a true believer. Now, circumcision, uncircumcision counts for nothing. Neither does a sinner's prayer if not accompanied by true living faith. True faith produces gospel obedience. So catch this, we need to get this right. It is not that our obedience is what saves us, right? It is not through our works that we are justified. Rather, it is by faith alone that we are united to Christ. And if that faith is a living faith, it will produce something in us. It will work itself out in love. Love for God and love for neighbor. For this is the law of God. Our new hearts, the hearts God has given us, are hearts that are filled with love for him. And love for God produces within us a desire to please him. And in order to please him, we obey him. As Jesus said in John 14, 15, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And so with our new hearts, we will obey the word of the Lord. We will put sin to death. And we will strive to conform our lives to the will of God revealed to us in his word. We will seek to worship God with every part of our lives offering ourselves as living sacrifices to the Lord, Romans 12, 1. We will seek to love our neighbors, treating them as we want to be treated. All of this is the fruit of faith. True faith works itself out in love. Love for God and love for neighbor. For this is the fulfilling of the law. Let's pray.